My name is Emma Herber, and I am a small group leader for Impulse. I'm Jolene Sanderson. I serve in Connection Community. Uh, my name is Andy Rice. My wife and I serve in Impulse. My name is Rick McComb, and I serve in two different ministries, uh, Connection Community and Reengage. I am Stephanie Rice, and I serve in Impulse. I'm Jenny Davis, and I serve on a couple different places. Uh, I'm Nate Hitzman. Um, I serve at Pathway. My name is Emily McComb, and I serve with Connection Communities and also with Reengage. I'm Jamie Nicholson, and I've served at Pathway uh, in many different areas. But my passion has been uh, for uh, uh, mission work, in, uh, specifically Mozambique. Uh, so I'll be going back to Mozambique for my fourth trip. Um, it has changed my life. I couldn't say about uh, 10 years ago that I would have ever been able to share the gospel and um, to be able to, to go to Mozambique and be able to share the gospel with the Mozambican people um, has just been a, a privilege and an honor and, and it is what God's called me to do. Um, the other thing about, uh, about serving and, and serving at Pathway, to me, it, uh, it makes the church feel small. Uh, I've met so many great people and um, you know, I can walk into church on Sunday and, and just say hi and, and have, a, uh, have a story and have a relationship with just a bunch of different people, which, is, uh, which I think is, uh, is great and makes uh, Pathway um, my home church. I think we thank Jamie for uh, sharing his story with us this morning. Really good idea of uh, connecting in mission, connecting in ministry uh, within the context of your local body is so important. This is a big place, and a lot of times the reason why we, we push in seasons for you to get engaged in ministry is that you can get engaged actually in community and, uh, and getting along with others that, that are involved in a work that you're passionate about, and so that's one opportunity for you, as, as Todd was talking about the cards earlier, we're just looking for ways to connect more deeply in the life of the church, and uh, it's a really important place and a really important thing to do. As well, and uh, actually, there's a big mission deal that went on here yesterday, uh, Friday and Saturday, which was the um, the uh, uh, garage sale and Truvine garage sale. And uh, in the course of that weekend, uh, we raised over thirty thousand dollars, so that's a pretty cool thing. Yeah, and a lot of stuff went down to the rescue missions tre treasure house yesterday as well. So all the stuff that didn't get sold is going to continue to be reinvested in the community and. I was here yesterday morning at 7.30 with all my kids, and we worked it until 10, and just had a great opportunity to meet people, and to meet people in our community, and to meet some of you as well that I haven't met before, and seeing the team work together. Kelly Ostrom and Laura and I did a fantastic job of pulling this deal together. It's a big event, and those dollars are going to be used to come alongside of families that are adopting and in, uh, in bringing about some matching grants along the way, and it's just a really tremendous opportunity for us to invest uh, in the lives of those that deeply and desperately need a home and need a forever family. And so you get a chance to be a part of that, whether you donate your stuff, whether you buy the stuff, or whether you work when we're selling the stuff, whatever it may be, you play a part in that. So I want to thank you for that. When we talked about Unleashed, initially we talked three weeks, and those three weeks were going to be focused around in here, going on in here. And a couple weeks ago, I just really felt impressed, and after, even after having a conversation with a few friends, that I think we need to extend this out a little bit. So we're actually going to extend the series out a few more weeks because there's some really critical things that I want to talk to you about and that we want to talk to you about in these next few weeks as well. But, but so oftentimes we think about ministry. We think about ministry happening in the four walls of the church. But let me ask you a question. How many of you work? How many of you work? Yeah, we all work. And so what does it look like uh, to, uh, to really be unleashed in your workplace? What does it look like? I want to talk to you about that this morning, and I'm going to set the stage. I'm going to talk for just a few moments and set the stage, and then I've got a group of friends that are going to come up, and I don't want you to leave because it's a really important conversation we're going to have with them. And I think as we wrap up the morning, I think every one of us in this room are going to walk away with something that's going to be tangible for how we can be, how we can be used in a powerful way within the context of our work. And here's the, here's the big idea this morning. It's really simply this. That is the secret to unleashing your work is to do it for God. And I know what some of you are saying. You're saying, well, Ron, that's easy for you to do because look at what you do. I mean, you work for God every day. You know, that's your job. So it's, an easy, it's easy for you to do that. Well, what you miss sight of is who do I work for? Who do I have to work with? I have to work with all of you. That makes it a challenge is what it makes it. So, but uh, well, you're, you're a blessing sometimes. Um, 
But when it comes to our work, really, we work and we, at times we miss sight of the fact that, that God has us at work for a reason and he's given us a work for a reason. And, and scripture actually speaks uh, to work. It really does and how we can carry out our faith in Christ at work. Matter of fact, in Ephesians 6, 5 through 9, uh, Paul gives us some words. These words are spoken to slaves during his day. I'll talk about that in a moment, as well as to masters. But within the context of these few verses, he actually gives us some principles to hang on to as it relates to work. He says, slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not to win their favor with their eye, when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly. If you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are a slave or free. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. Let me just speak a little bit from a contextual perspective uh, of, of this. You know, in, in Paul's day, it's been said that in Rome there are about 60 million slaves in Rome. In Paul's day, a, a kind of terrible idleness had actually fallen on the citizens of Rome, and Rome was the ruler of the world, and therefore it was beneath the dignity of a Roman citizen to work. And so practically, all work was done by slaves. All occupations were done by slaves. They're the ones who did it. And some slaves were treated very well. Uh, some slaves were, were treated with great kindness and with great appreciation, and, and, uh, and there were other slaves that were not treated so well. Matter of fact, um, most were not. So basically, the life of a slave was grim and terrible. And in law, slaves were not people, but things. Aristotle lays it down this way. There can never be friendship between master and slave, for they have nothing in common. For a slave, he says, is a living tool, just as a tool is an inanimate slave. And so Paul gives some advice to slaves. He gives some advice to slaves that actually translate into to our lives as it relates to those of us who work and, and are involved maybe even in leadership at work. He says, be Christian where you are. Do your work with an awareness that God's eye is on you. Do your work with obedience, humility, and respect, and be an extension of Christ in your work. There are about 168 hours in the week. Uh, we get you for maybe two or three hours in the course of the week, sometimes more, sometimes less. But the bulk of your time is spent in the in, in not in these four walls. The bulk of your time is actually spent in your homes and in your neighborhoods and in your workplaces. And and so my role, our role, is to equip you. And so I want to equip you this morning because your work matters and how you do your work really matters. And I want to give you just three things to hang on to. One is this, and that is when you work, work as a calling. Work as a calling. Work is good. Uh, Genesis 2, uh, we get this uh, very, very kind of a a really narrow scope as to the creation and God's instruction to Adam and Eve. And in, in Genesis 2, verse 15, he tells him, listen, you've got all this that's around you that I've created for you, but you need to work it. You need to work the ground. You have a work that you're going to do. And matter of fact, in Genesis 1, 27 and 28, a little narrow scope of creation, it says that God created man in his image, and certainly work is important to God. And then he says, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. He says, you've got a work to do. And go and do your work. And, and, and I made you to work. And so therefore work. Now here's, here's where, where we kind of get into, a, it gets a little slippery here within the context of the church community. What there is a tendency to do is this. And that is we tend to separate sacred from secular. We say, well, the work that you need to find and the ministry you need to find needs to be found within the four walls of your local church. And I would agree that there is tremendous importance when you're in the context of a local body of Christ, connect in a ministry, connect with one another, develop those gifts and use those passions. Some of you, you work in jobs and you go to work and you're thinking, this is not my passion, but you find your passion within the context of ministry and that's where you find a deep sense of fulfillment. But the fact is, is that we cannot separate sacred from secular. What happens in your heart makes a difference where you're working and within the context of those environments. And so when you live from the perspective of calling, what you begin to see is you begin to see your place of employment as a strategic place where God has placed you. Uh, last Monday, I got an email from Sherry Beal. She's the wife of Brian Beal. She's a neuro-occupational therapist over at Parkview. She wrote me a very long email, 
And uh, she apologized actually for it. And uh, she wrote me this email. She had no idea what she was setting herself up for because she was writing me the email to encourage me. But in the midst of it, she actually gave me an illustration. So I probably owe her a couple bucks for this. Um, but, uh, but she was talking about, uh, at the beginning of her email, about her job and as, as it relates to even dealing with difficult patients. It's really, really an awesome image of someone who takes their work as a calling. She says, at times I have to work with difficult patients. And gang members, surviving drunk driver, or just plain mean-spirited people. That's when I have to decide to love them. How do I do that? I came up with a method to help me see difficult people as unique human beings. They don't know this, but inside my head, I force myself to take in all of their physical features, noting the color of their hair, eyes, skin, tall, short, skinny, not so skinny, how they sound, and then I praise God for the work of art that I'm beholding, for they are his creation. Then inside my head, I literally say, God loves you, then I love you too. And oftentimes I sneak in some of God's word when conversing with them because they are not usually complainers. They are usually complainers about how everyone is not doing their jobs or whatnot. I simply say, I hear what you're saying. All I can say is I am for you. I am not against you. I used to not struggle trying to not be judgmental during therapy sessions, but now I can push away the details as soon as I enter the room, seeing each person for who they are and accepting them just as they are. I'm thankful God has taught me to open up my eyes and soak in what he has fearfully and wonderfully made. And then sometimes I get to meet that one-of-a-kind patient. And over the years, I've had a few. And she begins to talk about a 30-year-old woman that's battling with cancer and how she's walking with her through that, through that stage of her life as well. It's about working from a calling. The second is, and that is that you have to work for a platform. No matter the job, no matter the position that you're given, uh, a platform whereby Christ can be seen and shared through the, work, through the way that you work. I mean, you're given this platform. God has given you the platform. And in giving that platform, he's given you the opportunity to allow Christ to be seen through you as, as in the way that you work. I had this happen to me this past week. Let me kind of give you a little personal illustration that happened on Tuesday, or, or this, this past week, I think maybe Thursday evening. I, I went to a local grocery store. I won't tell you what it is, but I decided to get healthy. I need to start getting healthy in what I'm eating. So I went to the store to buy healthy food, and I filled up my cart with some healthy food. And I got to the checkout line, and there was a, there was a young guy behind the checkout line, teenager behind the checkout line. And, uh, and so I, he's running my groceries through. It came to like $40 in groceries. And so in the midst of that, I, I put my debit card in the chip machine. I don't know about you. Any of you hate chip machines? I hate the chip machine. I don't know who created that thing, but I hate those things. So I, I put the chip in there, and uh, I, you know, I'm waiting for it to come through. And, and then it kind of did something, which normally it does. So I pulled the card out. And then it's to pull in the card out. He, finally, he asked me, he said, do you have, a, you, do you have a account, you know, a number here? I said, yes. So I give him my number. He punches that in. And uh, so I'm going to run my card again. He said, no, hold on for a second. He reaches into his wallet, pulls out a card of some sort, slides it, and uh, punches in something else, and uh, then finishes running through. So I'm thinking to myself, well, my, obviously my debit card went through, but I should have punched in my code. And so anyway, he says, here you go. And so I grab my groceries, walked out, and I get home. My girls were in the kitchen. I said, you know what? I was just at this store, bought these groceries, and I said, there was some young kid behind the checkout lane, and I think he just bought my groceries. And I got in, I pulled out the receipt, and I looked at the credit card number, those last four numbers, and they were not my numbers. That kid bought my groceries. He brought my groceries. I'm thinking to myself, he didn't look old enough to have a credit card. <laughs> so he probably had his dad's credit card. <laughs> so in other words, you know, he didn't buy my groceries. Hey, dad's going to buy your groceries tonight. I, think I should have bought more groceries than what I should have done. No, not really. So later that night, I'm on a run because I want to get back in shape. And uh, so I'm going through, I'm making the, the, the run around the Y, and, um, and I've got this song that I'm playing over and over and over and over and over again. And, uh, and then in the midst of, of doing this little run and listening to the song, it was as if the Holy Spirit was just kind of nudging me. It was one of those moments, just nudging me. And just all I heard was, he's watching. He's watching you, Ron. He's watching. And friends, we all have people watching. And your job is not a distraction from true ministry, but it's ministry, and your, your vocation is actually a place to live out your calling. It is. Now, let me just say something to, to all the moms in this room, the stay-at-home moms and stay-at-home dads. You have a huge work to do. 
I want to say it. Next week, we'll talk to moms next week. you got a huge work to do. Now as a single dad, <laughs> oh my goodness, I appreciate it even more. And, and I just want to say that the work that you do, it is an incredibly, probably the most valuable work that anyone could do of making that decision to honker down with your kids and to raise them and to invest in them and to influence them. And I just want to say right at the beginning, thank you, thank you, thank you for taking your work so seriously. Can we thank them, thank them as well this morning? We really should. So Romans 12, 10, 11 says, Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. He says, Do your work with excellence. Do your work with excellence. God's given you this work. Do it with excellence. And do your work as serving the Lord. In other words, don't get lazy on the job. Don't fall asleep on the job. Now, let me just tell you this. If you end up falling asleep on the job, I've given you 10 excuses for what you can say if, in fact, you're caught napping at your desk. Here it is. Number one, they told me at the blood bank this might happen. <laughs> Number two, this is just a 15-minute power nap like they raved about in that management course you sent me to. Uh, number three, whew, guess I, felt the t- felt, I guess I left the top off the whiteout. You got here just in time. You know? <laughs> number four, did you, did you think I was sleeping? No, I, I was meditating on the mission statement that you shared with me and envisioning a new paradigm. Uh, number five, I was testing keyboard for dual, dual resistance. Uh, number six, I was doing a highly specific yoga exercise to relieve work, related stress. Are you discriminatory toward people who practice yoga? Uh, number seven, why did you interrupt me? I was concentrating and had almost figured out a solution to our company's biggest problem. Number eight, the coffee machine is broken. Number nine, someone must have put decaf in the wrong pot. Number ten, in Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> that one works every time. Trust me, used it many times, many times. Um, but the way you work, listen, the way you work will determine the platform that you're given. Remember Joseph in Genesis who was enslaved, sold into slavery by his brothers, and, and he worked, he, he served with integrity, he served with diligence, he, he served with character, he served as serving unto the Lord. And every time, God continued to raise him in his position. Fact is, you need to work as a calling, work for a platform, and the third is work with a mission. Work with a mission. Now, um, mission is certainly a focus for all of us, and, and certainly for some of you, you may walk into work and you think to yourself, oh, i got to do this job again. Well, if you turn it towards mission, you realize my mission here is to live out the character of Christ to those around me and to be responsive to those around me, to be sensitive to those around me. But let me say this. It's difficult to stay on mission without rest. It's difficult to stay on mission without rest. I want to talk to you about that for just a moment. This came out within my, my study this week, and, and uh, it was just a great insight that someone gave to me. And the fact is, is that when you look into Exodus, when the people are leaving uh, Egypt, going to the Promised Land, God stops them in, in their tracks and he gives them those two rules, those ten rules to live by. And one of those rules is that you're to set aside a day, the Sabbath, and you're to keep that, to keep that day holy. And really what Sabbath is, Sabbath was there to remind them where this all comes from, who this all comes from. It was a reminder, remembering, causing them to remember who provides for you. And Sabbath serves to reorient our focus back to what really matters most. Think about this. When Adam and Eve were created, on what day were they created? You might want to guess. What was the day? First day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day? Sixth day. So on the seventh day, what did they do? They hadn't even done anything yet. They rested. It's almost as if, there's, a, there's just a little thought here. It's almost as if God creates them on the sixth day to do work. They go into that seventh day of rest realizing that on the first day following their existence, they were already resting, and they remembered what God had done, not what they had done. And we need to understand what our ultimate mission in life is and work towards that, but Sabbath keeps you in perspective. Let me just say this to you right now. This is the preacher preaching to the preacher. There's an old adage. I've used it before. Those who can't do, teach. (laughs) I'm teaching you about Sabbath, having a hard time with Sabbath. Laura was our Sabbath Nazi. I kid you not, I mean, Sunday, she was the Nazi on Sunday, and that might not have been a good thing to say, but anyway, 
mm, edit that one. Um, but, but she, I mean, she was really, really just, she wanted us to, to hold on to that, to that Sabbath and, you know, no electronics and no TV and, and uh, no homework and whatever else. And, and, uh, and you don't even want to know it goes on our house right now. And, and yet there's that, that moment now for me where I'm realizing it's easy for me, it's very easy for me to tap every day. Tap every day. It's easy for me to, to go through a week and work in some way every day. And what I'm realizing is, and, and this has been helpful for me, a good reminder for me, is that when I step back and I take a Sabbath, it gives me perspective. Worship reminds me who's in charge. The worship we just had a few moments ago reminds us who's in charge in those moments. That last song that Jordan sang reminds us who's in charge. It's refreshing. It challenges us. And, and the fact is that sometimes for me, um, you know, even the other night when I was out on that little run, that was Sabbath for me, believe it or not. I mean, I, I enjoy doing that. It's good for me to do that, relieve some stress, some challenges. I always have my head set in. There was a song I landed on this past week. I, I was, as I was running, I heard this song, and I ended up just... I had heard it probably multiple times, but for some reason, the other night, I heard it, and I started playing it over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And God used it just to speak into my, just to speak into my soul. This morning, as I pulled in the lot, I had Bella with me, and I pulled in the lot, and I parked my, my car, and I just sat there, and she just kind of moved up onto the council, and we just sat there quietly, and once again, we just listened to that song just to gain some perspective. Rest allows you to reflect in your identity found in Christ, not in what you do. Steve Cochran said it well. He said, you don't rest from your work. You work out of your rest. And so uh, you, need, you need to rest at times. And we all need to etch out time to rest and to listen and to respond to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And when you do, you're able to work from the perspective of his leadership in your life. Moms, <coughs> stay-at-home dads, you know, I, as I said, I, I get it, and the fact is that, that it's hard work. I mean, you know, when God said, be fruitful and multiply, that was the easy work. That was the fun work, you know. Raising them, man, that's hard work is what they did. It wears you out. But having time to find a place of rest just recalibrates you, redirects you. And so when it comes to your work, work as a calling, work for a platform, and work with a mission. So we want to talk to you about that in a real practical way over these next few moments. And as we, as we move into this, this part of the message, there's a little, little video that we put together to help get your mind wrapped around this. And I would really encourage you, don't leave during this time. What we're going to do in these next few moments is incredibly practical and going to be meaningful for everyone that's in this room. So watch the monitors. Work. Most of us spend over half our lives at work. Whatever it is you fill the nine to five with, planting crops, building cars, taking care of patients, teaching students, or running a business, work is where most of life happens. For some, work is a drain. They dread Monday mornings, forcing themselves to struggle through because they need the paycheck, while many times feeling trapped and beaten down by their job. Some people love their work. They're good at what they do. It energizes them. It's a place of security, a place to chase dreams, desires, and success. At work, they find fulfillment. We often forget to connect our faith to our work. We don't consider the reasons God may have us at our job. We don't think about the purpose and meaning we could bring to our work. We simply focus on how it makes us feel. But what if we saw our work as an opportunity to worship? As Christians, we are called to serve Christ with our lives. For a few, that means working as a pastor, a youth minister, or a missionary. Others serve the church by teaching children or singing in the choir. But when Sunday is over, most of us return to our jobs outside the church. For us, our mission is in the marketplace. We may not be the kind of missionary who moves to the far regions of Africa, but around the conference table, around the water cooler, around the cubicle, we have an opportunity to worship the God who created us. He gave us skill. He gave us passion. He gave us work. When we do our jobs with excellence and integrity and diligence, it's an act of worship. We are displaying God's craftsmanship to the non-believing world around us. 
we are earning the right to be heard. We don't see a divide between Sunday and Monday, between the sacred and the secular. We've been invited into parts of the world that a pastor or traditional missionary will never see. We have conversations with people who would never set foot in a church. Whether we love or dread our work, we choose to turn the focus away from ourselves and toward the mission God has for us. Church is not the only place we worship, and Sundays are not the only days in our calendars that have meaning. Every day on Mission for God brings us great joy. Like the heroes before us, we can be modern-day Noahs and Josephs and Peters who are called with a purpose. God has designed us. He created us to work and to worship. For us, work is worship. Yeah, so we're going to just take the next few moments. We're just going to kind of make this real practical and got a few friends up here that are going to help me do this. And so why don't we start from the end and work our way this way. And Kevin you. Williams. Um, I'm CEO and president of Univertical in Angola, Indiana with manufacturing plant in Suzhou, China. Yeah, good. I'm Janine Murphy, and I'm a second grade teacher at Huntertown Elementary. I'm Todd Bauman, and I work with Aunt Millie's Bakeries here in town. And I'm Dirk Rally, and I host a TV show. Yeah. So is work a calling? How is it a calling for each of you? Go ahead, Todd, jump in. Absolutely. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, if we open our eyes to them, opportunities are there. Uh, I think that video pointed out so well, um, you know, the, you come into contact with people that, um, you know, maybe need a listening ear or maybe um, over the course of time, you can build up enough trust by using integrity, intentionality, those kinds of things to have an opportunity. Yeah. You just got to be aware. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, I'm called to what I do. Uh, I go back to Ecclesiastes talks about, you know, if you enjoy your work, that's a gift uh, from God. And I certainly enjoy my work. I want to enjoy it as much as Devin enjoys playing drums. That's, that's the goal. <laughs> uh, I mean, that's, that's fun. Um, but it's... It is. It is one of those that you almost feel like, you know, this is where I'm meant to be. I, I you know, I, I'm happy that I found a place that I enjoy. Hmm. That's good. I, um, I was a Christian before I was a teacher, so I consider myself a Christian teacher. And the Holy Spirit gives us gifts, and I believe that the gift that he's given me is to teach. And also the Bible says that our purpose is to glorify God, so that's my purpose. And hmm. my, my job is, is, yes, it's my calling, and it's what I get to do for him. That's great. Yeah. Playing off of the purpose, when I was watching the, the VBS introduction, Made for a Purpose, I kind of intertwined purpose and calling as the same thing. I've, got, I've rolled mine up into like three statements, and it's taken me 50 years to get there, so I guess I'm a slow learner. <laughs> but number one is to glorify God and, and all that I do. Number two is influencing others for the kingdom of God. And number three is to add value to those around me so that they'd be successful in life and in business. So I use my work for all three of those. That's great. So within your calling, you've got purpose already played out. How am I going to carry out this, this calling in my life? So it kind of translates really into the next one. How do you, how do you live out your faith in a personal way at work? I mean, is, I, I know for me, that's an easy deal. I don't struggle on that one, but... Uh, but again, I appreciate what the video says, you know, Todd, you even alluded to it, is that it's, I think for, for Christians walking in a workplace, what a great opportunity to live out your faith um, in ways that, that hopefully can become um, kind of a sweet aroma to, to those around you. Draw them in. So how do you, how do, you do that? Well, so my job, um, my wife always says the church needs a PR agent, and uh, she doesn't mean this church necessarily, but just the church. And so I get to, to put people on TV who have uh, you know church pair church organizations, the rescue mission and, and folks like that, and I think they come in and they know that they're going to hear, uh, it, you know, it's going to be a friendly environment. Uh, they're going to be affirmed in what they're doing, and I think that helps. I where I, I think struggle um, is with the people that I work with that I haven't really uh, got to know them as well as I should, and it's the old you know Francis Vassisi quote about. Right. Uh, you know, always preach the gospel and when necessary, use words. Unfortunately, he didn't say that, yeah. but that's been my mindset uh, for too long. And I, th I feel like I need to step up and pray for those divine appointments at work mm -hmm. where I might have something to say. Mm -hmm. That's good. And something to say may not necessarily be repent. Right. You know, the yeah, world is no. coming to an end. You Although, need to... you want to unleash the church, we could all 
take the signs up to our workplace and yeah. bullhorns and yeah, we could do that. That's a <laughs> good takeaway. Some Sunday, give everybody things to wear. That'd be. Uh, let's not do that. Probably not. Okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Ty. I mean, I don't want to jump ahead too much into platform, right. but sometimes um, platform um, can allow that. Um, you know, uh, yeah. I don't know. You just. You, you work with them enough and you say, hey, this success um, can really, uh, it's going so well, it has to be God touched. And mm. they get to know, um, you know where you stand. And I just recently had a, 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 a co-worker that I've been doing this with for a while who lost his dad. And he's just really struggling. Mm. And um, yeah. if there's anything I can do to help, you know, let me know. So it's, it's not like you're out there with the blowhorn. I mean, sometimes it feels like, you know, when you're saying, hey, you know, I'd like to share my faith with you. They're like, um, they're hearing, hey, do you mind if I judge you? You know, mm. and that's, 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 that's not it at all. Um, mm. So you have to earn that, I guess. Yeah. And sometimes um, it takes a little bit of time to do, but when the opportunities arise, um, you know, be brave and, and reach out and say, hey, is there anything I can do to help you with that? It's good being sensitive. I, I try to be uh, sensitive to the Holy Spirit and, and just listen to what, you know, the kids, as they come in each day, if they're, whatever kind of mood they're in, they're bringing in whatever's that going on a lot of times at home, and they're struggling with it and processing it, so I'm, I'm just trying to be sensitive to them. You know, I have scripture verses on my desk to keep me focused and to help remind me of why I'm there and just ways that I can um, just draw strength from God right there at my, my little spot. That's good. Kevin? The way is, is just walking through life with people, hmm. through the ups and through the downs, and sharing with them the hope that I have that gets me through the difficult times. Yeah, it's good. Do you um, on the you know we talked about using a platform. How do you, how then as a Christ follower, how do you use the platform that God has given each of you to have an influence on those that are around you? All of you are in different positions, you know, but how do you use that? What's good, Kevin? <clears throat> I'm going to share a different story. Okay. Um, but I think that we're, we're called to be faithful farmers, hmm. planting seeds. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those seeds, we won't know the result until we get to heaven. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, my first my responsibility in China, I was a general manager in helping build that business. And so I was the company representative with the local government officials. And a couple of times a year, I would have to go meet with them, have dinner with them, or have, I think we always did lunches. So not the first time, but the second time I share with them that I was a Christian. And, and before we had, you know, which is my tradition, before I have lunch, I always say a prayer. <clears throat> and I ask him, is it okay if I pray? And they said, sure. So I prayed. <laughs> so fast forward a few years later, and I would do this two to three, two, about two, two to three times a year. So fast forward on to when um, our time was coming to an end, had another one of those lunches planned. And I was running late. I always left 30 minutes early, but I never got there because of the traffic or whatever. So I showed up late, and everybody's sitting around the table, and they're waiting on me. And so I get there, I sit down, and I pick up my chopsticks, and I start eating. And nobody's eating. And I said, like, what are you guys waiting on? They said, we're waiting to pray. I'm like, oh, <laughs> all right. I, th I thought that was pretty cool. That's a great story. That's a great story. What, what else? Go ahead, Janine. Well, um, we have a, a moment of silence at the beginning of each day after we say the pledge. And so at the beginning of the year, I just I let the kids know that this is a time for you to just um, quiet yourself, time to refocus. And if you want to pray, I'll be doing that. So if you want to just close your eyes and pray. And so each day, I just make that a real serious um, part of our day. And that's something that we do at the beginning of each day. Um, I also let the kids have a special week where they get to be the student of the week and they get to fill out a poster and so I do the first one at the beginning of the year and I share my favorite book which is the Bible and then I talk about you know it says what what makes you special and I said well because God made me so I kind of open the door and just hmm. let God be a comfortable word in our classroom so throughout the year you know the kids aren't afraid I don't want them to be afraid and I mentioned this earlier that I always God always gives me at least one one or two Christian kids and very often they're pathway kids so 
we always have a special connection and yeah. they just will ask questions or bring up, oh, this is, you know, Good Friday, the day Jesus died or something. And that's just a comfortable part yeah. of our classroom. That's good. Ty? Yeah, well, I have a director of continuous improvement uh, title. So I actually get to, you know, do things that are, uh, I'm a unique position with doing platform. And so I've been working on a, uh, a leadership development uh, program over the past couple of years and um, has kind of a servant based theme to it um, kind of coming from the GLS stuff and um, you know we've been able to this to continue to grow it and it's at a point right now over the past couple of years it's just an open invite kind of a grassroots kind of a thing but it's gotten bigger than any room that we have within our company there's about 200 people downtown and roughly 40 to 60 people show up every other week wow. and sometimes it has some really powerful stuff but I mean, ultimately, it's, it's a message about growing yourself, um, thinking of others, and doing more uh, lifting than leaning, really. Mm -hmm. So, um, and from that, there's a small group of us that have, you know, grown together in organizing these things, and it's been neat to be able to draw close to them and say, wow, this is God-touched, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And um, there was even one of them um, ran into an instance to where um, they, uh, they had made a mistake, and it wasn't malicious or anything, but... Um, they thought they were going to lose their job yeah. and really nervous at that point. And I, I just said, do you mind if I pray? And yeah. I said, yeah, I'd like that. And so I just don't feel like without that platform, without that experience that I would have been able to have that opportunity. Yeah. So. Kind of earned the respect and earned the right to speak into their life. Yeah, it's good. Dirk? Well, as the weakest link up here, I, um, uh, <laughs> I you know, I, 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 will, I will try to send people e emails of encouragement uh, because I think, uh, you know, our industry, broadcasting in general, is, is very, you know, it's, it's pretty tough. I mean, you're out there publicly and all your mistakes, people get to see. So, yeah. yeah. Um, so, but if, if somebody does something well, I'll try to, I'll try to speak at least some encouragement to them. The thing that, it, that centers me is I put on my phone about six months ago at one o'clock every day, it says pray. Because I, I can do a fairly good job praying in the morning. I do a fairly good job praying at night. I was doing a terrible job from 8 to 5. And just having that on my phone at least recenters me uh, as to who's in charge and, and what my day really is all about. Yeah, it's good. That kind of segues into this element of perspective. How do you, how do you keep it all in perspective? Your work, how do you keep this all in perspective? What, what are some tangible things you do that are helpful? Kevin? Well, it's <clears throat> having a having a quiet time with God. As this the old statement, if you don't come apart for a while, you will come apart. Mm -hmm. And I really believe that. So you know, every day I take about uh, ten minutes to spend some time in the Word. I have a thirty-five minute drive up to Angola, so I, I'm able to um, spend some time praying and talking, kind of unpacking my day. But usually, when I get to the office. You know, before I before I open the the computer and get into the uh, all the emails and everything else, I have a I have a planner. I'm kind of old school. I have a planner that I use for making notes, and inside that planner, I have a a little prayer. And number one on the prayer says, "Lord, I'm expendable. Another day or another decade of life, whatever pleases you." Number two, Lord, I serve at your pleasure. Use me or not, whatever pleases you. Lord, your kingdom matters. Mine doesn't. Lord, you are God. I am not. Help me keep that straight today. Hmm. That's good. Amen. That's good. Jeanine? Um, I, again, I said I have scripture verses, and it just kind of constantly reminds me. There's other Christian teachers, and we sometimes get together and pray or encourage each other that way. So it just helps me remember that this is... Um, you know, this is my mission, but I'm, I'm not, I don't have to be overwhelmed with it. It's good. I'll just plan off what Kevin was saying that, you know, just being intentional with trying to um, know that it isn't all about me. Um, it isn't my identity, um, you know, and being intentional with that. It's, it's easy to forget when you get your nose down and, and you're working on something or, you know, you've imposed or there's been imposed some kind of deadlines, you know, all in his time, really. So, if you can remove yourself from it all being on your shoulders, uh, that's definitely helpful for me. That's good. Yeah, the, the rest speaks to me too because when I get pressure to, to stay late or to, to come in on weekends, I have to remind myself because the pressure is really for me, mm -hmm. I am not my job. Mm -hmm. 
that my identity is not in my successes or my failures. My identity is found in Christ. And if I can remember that and stay focused on that, it suddenly frees me to, to rest, yeah. to, to walk away and say, you know what, that's enough. Yeah, yeah it's hard to do. I, I struggle with that personally at times, walking away from it. And it's easy to bring it home you know, for me to bring it home all the time. I bring it home all the time. But uh, I guess we talked about, sec- you know, first service, and that is that it's pretty amazing that, uh, that the minute that you die, the world actually keeps going on without you. I mean, you would have thought that it would stop, but it doesn't. And, and it doesn't take long. It takes maybe about five minutes before somebody else comes in and fills your spot. You know, which really feels good, uh, but you don't feel it anyway, so I guess it really doesn't matter. But, uh, but I think it, it, it helps you to, to realize, I've remembered over the years just that, that sense that in the end, it's not going to be my work that's going to be sitting with me up. It's going to be those that are closest to me, those that have the highest value to me. And, and that, when you're able to keep that perspective as well, I think that, that keeps everything right, rightly aligned with where you need to be. So it's good. Hey, thanks. Let's thank these guys for Thanks, Very good. I want to just give you a little little bit of an opportunity here. Uh, every year in Fort Wayne, um, a, sil- a simulcast is done called the Global Leadership Summit. It's done out of out of Chicago, Illinois, Willow Creek Community Church. Laura and I, over the past years, we, I think we only missed two, and I think it's been going on like for 12 years, or I don't know how many years it's been going on, but we've got a little slide that's there. And, uh, and actually, Kelly Bird, who uh, is the local... Uh, uh, connection for this, the guy that leads this deal. Kelly was actually going to be with me uh, this morning to share with this, and uh, he had his appendix taken out last night, so he emailed me from the hospital bed going, I can't come, and I said, stay where you're at. Uh, but anyway, there's another site that's here that, that has been developed through his leadership, fortwayneleaders.com. And if you go to that site, you can actually sign up on a discounted price on that, and you can actually, there are actually scholarships that are out there as well. The business community in Fort Wayne has come around this and invested a, a tremendous amount of money in this deal. Fort Wayne is the largest site in the world, and there will be an opportunity for over 5,000 this year at the Coliseum, so easy parking, a great facility, and I'll tell you what, um, you're going to be challenged. I don't care if you're, I don't care in what field of work you're in, I don't care who you are as a student or whatever else, this is a real opportunity just to be challenged, recharged, and, and get refocused as well, and so I just really encourage you to take a look. At that. I'd love to see Pathway be the largest church represented at the summit this year. And I, I think just like what you heard from Todd and heard from Kevin, you know, the opportunity then to, to really become diligent about coming alongside of those that you're around and saying, hey, I read something that's really great, you ought to read it, or let's work at this together. I mean, just it really will challenge your thinking in so many ways, and it doesn't matter in what field you're working in. I want to give you one last uh, prayer request, and uh, that is that Angie and Bob Morris, uh, they were around our church for a number of years and uh, uh, they moved to Kansas a couple years ago, and last week, uh, Bob suddenly died. And um, so on Tuesday of this week, 6 o'clock, we'll be having Bob's memorial service here as well. So for those of you that have been connected with Bob and Angie, they're really highly involved in our marriage ministry and just did a fantastic job. And I think Angie's probably in here somewhere, but I'm not going to call her out. So let's stand up together, shall we? Let's stand. <clears throat> Father, I'm so thankful for, for just the gentle reminders in my week this week of what's important. Um, you know, I think about last night and coming home from uh, from having dinner out afterwards after speaking and coming home and uh, laying on that bed and um, having my three oldest kids plopping down beside me and time to laugh and just process our day. It was a reminder of what's important, what really matters. And Lord, I, I would pray for all of us that as we leave this place, we realize that we're going to walk into our homes and our neighborhoods and our workplaces, and maybe a restaurant to eat, that we are a reflection of you wherever we go. And I pray that we would be a good reflection, that we would look at what you've done for us and the jobs you've given to us, the work that you've challenged us and handed us, and that, Lord, we would begin to work as unto the Lord with excellence and diligence in reflecting and representing you in the best manner we can. We thank you for that opportunity. We thank you for what you've given to us because all of this comes from you and from you alone. And I pray for Angie and her family as they process Bob's death, and I pray that this week would be encouraging for them, kind towards them, um, 
it would be a week of them sensing your mercy and your compassion and your goodness and your love. And it's in the name of Jesus that I pray. Amen. See you later. But you have never failed me yet.